Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Can I congratulate all the speakers for, I think, what's been an excellent debate um, this evening. It's very good to be here. Um, it was a long time ago when I was sitting in those uh, chairs up there, Mr. President, with uh, William Hague alongside me back in the uh, early 1980s. And uh, at that time, we had a UK steel industry in crisis. We had a right-wing Tory majority government. We had a newly elected left-wing Labour leader in his 60s, so not much change there really since the, uh, <laughs> since the 1980s. Back then, the internet had not even been conceived of, let alone uh, invented, and China was a closed country with very little external trade, and William Hague had hair. So there are some <laughs> things that have, uh, that have changed in the meantime. But another thing that hasn't changed very much, uh, Mr. President, is that you could take either side often in a motion in front of the Oxford Union and logically uh, argue it, uh, depending on how you interpret and translate the wording of the motion. Of course, interpretation, translation is very important in politics. The former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, uh, who was a confident sort of chap, once made a speech in Paris in French. It went very well, and so subsequently he decided he'd do the question and answer session with the journalists, also in French, and he was asked in French what he thought of the then uh, socialist Prime Minister of France, Lionel Jospin, and he said, or at least he thought he said, uh, in French, I admire him in many ways. And when it was translated through the headphones, there were titters amongst the press corps because it was translated as, I desire him, in, 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 in many different positions. So, so how, you, how you translate uh, the motion, of course, is very important. So if we take the strong interpretation of the motion, which some honourable uh, members opposite have done and argued that the word sacrifice in the motion means that we shouldn't trade with China at all, and we've heard that from some of the uh, proposition speeches, uh, Mr. President, then it seems to me there's no question that though I wouldn't normally find myself on the same side as Sir Malcolm Rifkind on a, on a, on a motion, uh, there's, you have no choice but to oppose the motion. However sympathetic... Uh, you are on the case being made about human rights, which all of us on this side of the house, I think it's fair to say, are. You know, if you consider the level of trade that there is between uh, the European Union and China, because the European Union is actually the body at this level that we're really talking about in terms of trade, unless something dramatic happens later this year, China and the European Union are two of the biggest traders in the world. After the United States, the European Union is China's biggest uh, trading partner with well over 1 billion euros per day uh, traded between the European Union and China. And the idea that we could easily sacrifice uh, that trading relationship, it seems to me, is neither feasible nor sensible. But even if we take the weaker interpretation of the motion and of the word sacrifice to mean limited uh, trade boycotts, as some other members on the proposition uh, have suggested, there is a real danger, as my honourable friends on this side have said, of it merely being tokenism. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't be powerful in our condemn condemnation of human rights abuses uh, by China. It isn't to say that the Chinese regime isn't appalling in many of the ways that it acts, and we've heard that passionately uh, uh, elucidated by both sides of the House tonight, and particularly uh, by the honourable lady opposite in her speech for the proposition. However, um, it's important that we don't forget that uh, and that we're not on this side of the house saying we shouldn't condemn Chinese human rights abuses. And uh, she mentioned the five Hong Kong publishers who disappeared recently, some of them from outside Hong Kong, one of them from within Hong Kong, an absolutely appalling case, one of whom is a British passport holder, Mr. President, another one of whom is a European Union passport holder with a Swedish passport and with a daughter studying in a UK uh, university. It's an appalling example of the abuses by the Chinese government. So it's absolutely right that we should pursue and pull every lever diplomatically and politically in order to try to influence uh, the actions of the Chinese uh, government. But it's unlikely, I have to say, Mr. President, it's very, very unlikely that trade sanctions on the scale being proposed by many of those on the other side uh, would be effective. And if it were to be the complete sacrifice of trade, it's simply an unrealistic proposition. 
Uh, indeed, there is an argument, and it's been made on this side of the house, a perfectly reasonable argument, that opening up China to trade in the longer term has improved the human rights in China. If we compare the situation today with the early 1980s, when I was sitting in that chair, uh, Mr. President, it's inconceivable, inconceivable that a student from Shanghai could have come to address this chamber 30 years ago. And that is because of the opening up of China. And we should remember that. Although the abuses should be condemned and we should be absolutely resolute in our condemnation, let's remember that China as a society has changed because of the opening up of China to trade and because it's more pluralistic and therefore it's reduced the ease with which the communist government can carry out the abuses which it undoubtedly uh, does. Now anyway, uh, it seems to me the real case, if we are to take trade sanctions against China, and the European Union currently is doing so with very good reason, is because of the, uh, China's trade policies which are impacting upon our own uh, industries. I want to talk briefly about the UK steel industry and the Chinese dumping of steel on European and world markets because the China's steel makers, 70% of which are state-owned and not profitable, they lose close to $34 per tonne on all the crude steel produced in China. Their 101 biggest steel firms lose $11 billion uh, in the first 10 months of 2015. And they've expanded their steel industry from 7.2 million tonnes of steel in 2003 uh, to over 107 million tonnes by 2015. Now, expanding their industry is one thing, but producing steel and selling it under cost uh, on European and world markets actually is a tactic to kill off its competition because the British steel industry is competitive. But even if every worker in the UK steel industry took no pay for their efforts, Britain could not produce steel at the price which, Chinese, that which the Chinese government is selling at, well under the cost it, it costs to produce even in China. So those are the reasons why we should be looking at trade sanctions and why in fact the European Union is introducing trade sanctions currently against Chinese steel, albeit not at a sufficiently high level. I want to say that the UK government needs to take a much tougher line on Chinese trade for the reasons that I've outlined. We can't afford to lose all our steel making capacity in this country and we're on the verge of doing so unless more decisive action is taken. The UK government's not been quick enough or strong enough in the European Union on this matter. It's organised a blocking minority on the long-term reform of trade defence uh, measures in the European Union. It's been the biggest cheerleader for market economy status for China, which shouldn't be granted until the dumping of steel on European markets is stopped. So, Mr President, we can't afford to sacrifice all trade with China. Everyone in this room knows that. We can't afford to do that. T totally unrealistic. One in five people in the world live in China. It's an unrealistic proposition. And we shouldn't make empty gestures, even where we are appalled by human rights abuses. But we should use persistent and robust uh, democracy, uh, diplomacy. But we must do much, much more to prevent unfair Chinese trade policy from wiping out a vital steel industry. I came to this university uh, from a steel family. I was the first pupil from my school to come to uh, Oxford University. My father was a steel worker. And it seems to me that we shouldn't sacrifice trade with China, which suggests a kind of, the word sacrifice suggests a kind of ritualistic gesture for effect rather than for actual result. But we must regulate that trade with China to ensure that we save our vital strategic steel industry from the Chinese manufactured steel gates of oblivion. Thank you.